On the 13th of October, 2019, 33-year-old photographer, English teacher, and international Christian missionary Richard Huckle was serving time in Her Majesty's prison full Sutton for convicted offenses. Also serving time in the same facility was 30-year-old convicted sex offender, Paul Fitzgerald. But Paul was no ordinary sex offender. You see, his blood was as cold as his darkness was thick. Paul is described by the court as a psychopath with a mixed personality disorder, coupled with a gender identity condition. As a matter of fact, he identifies as a woman named Kira, but some argue as to whether or not Paul really feels that way. Some believe he was simply putting on an act. From an early age, Fitzgerald had a string of criminal offenses peppering his record. He'd been convicted of indecent assaults in 2004 when he was 13, and 2006 when he was 15. Then in 2007, he caught charges for battery and criminal damage when he was only 16. But from there, the rap sheet of Paul Fitzgerald grew more sinister. It's believed that he even sexually assaulted a 15-year-old girl during one of these attacks. In 2009, at the age of 18, Paul attempted to sexually assault a female dog walker. The 59-year-old woman was approached by Fitzgerald in West Yorkshire. He asked her for directions out of a dead-end street that the pair were on at the time. But when the woman tried to help Paul find his way out, he caught her off guard. With a metal fork held to her face, Fitzgerald told the woman that he would stab her if she didn't do what he told her to do. Luckily, the woman managed to escape, leading to the arrest of Paul Fitzgerald, who was convicted of false imprisonment with the intent to commit a sexual act. He received an indefinite prison term for this because it seemed fairly clear that he would reoffend, especially after what the cops discovered in his possessions. When Paul was arrested, Authorities found diary entries that exposed the criminal's darkest recreational desires. Paul is quoted to have written that he loved raping women. He even jotted down his sick desire to sexually molest a four-year-old boy. He also stated in his diary that even if he was going to offend again, they couldn't stop him. And to top it all off, Paul's psychiatric evaluation revealed that one of his most disturbing fantasies was to kill and eat people. Even while in prison, Paul copped up another charge of false imprisonment when he attacked, detained, and threatened to stab a female prison officer that was checking his cell. He grabbed her by the neck, pinned her to the floor, and roared, Give me your keys or I'll stab you. The officer pleaded with Paul not to harm her, but her cries fell on deaf ears. Luckily, she too escaped and pressed her panic alarm just in time to avoid any major harm. It was obvious. Paul Fitzgerald was a loose cannon attached to a ticking time bomb and the count had begun. Soon, the explosive young man with a short fuse would detonate and commit one of the most horrible prison crimes in UK history. It was like something out of a Brazilian prison riot. A 
HMP Full Sutton is one of the UK's most notorious high security prisons. It's home to some of the most dangerous criminals in the country. What you see on your screen right now are videos shot inside HMP Full Sutton's walls that showcase riots, assaults, and dangerous bullying. This place is clearly no playground. But it was about to become a little more notorious, and a lot more horrifying than anyone could ever imagine. In 2019, Paul Fitzgerald decided he was going to kill a few of his fellow inmates at HMP Full Sutton. His target goal was four or five bodies in the prison, but Paul would only manage one murder before he was caught. And his victim was none other than soft-spoken, well-educated, first-time criminal offender, Richard Huckle. On October 13, 2019, after assembling a murder bag, Mr. Fitzgerald entered cell 43 and bound Richard Huckle's wrists with cable ties. He then proceeded to bash his captive's head on the floor several times, breaking his jaw before anally raping the defenseless fellow prisoner. When he was done, he violently forced the handle of a spoon into Richard's rectum, causing perforated damages to Huckle's insides. It's reported that Paul then continued to beat his victim more. Next, he cut up the helpless man with a homemade blade. After that, he forced a pin with a blade on the end of it up Huckle's nose and into his brain. And finally, Fitzgerald strangled Richard Huckle with an electrical cable sheath. The horrible ordeal lasted over 80 minutes. There was no one to stop Paul. When the prison guards found the two men, Paul was still straddling the dead body of Richard Huckle. Attempts to revive the fallen prisoner were pointless, and Paul Fitzgerald had just committed homicide. A young man was handed a death sentence today, but not from a judge. His fate was instead sealed by a fellow inmate at Her Majesty's prison full sudden. Richard Huckle endured unimaginable torture at the hands of psychopath Paul Fitzgerald. We'll have more information at 6 o'clock. Stay tuned for more updates on this shocking and sad case. When asked about the sexual assault on Richard Huckle, Paul told the doctor that evaluated his mental state for the murder trial that, quote, when he was laid down, with his pants down, and he knew what was coming, he didn't enjoy it, I'm sure. I knew what it feels like, but he doesn't. Rape was more about getting him a taste of that. End of quote. Paul showed no remorse for his actions and he blamed everything he did on his personality and gender identity disorders. Due to his mental health and the fact that Paul Fitzgerald was abused physically and sexually as a child, the jury gave the murdering rapist a lighter minimum sentence of 34 years. Paul was quoted saying that he got carried away by how much fun he was having during the murder of Richard Huckle. As a matter of fact, Fitzgerald stated that if he hadn't have run out of time, he was going to cook and eat parts of his victim. I'd now like you to pause the video and comment down below. I want to know how you feel about Paul Fitzgerald at this point in the story.
Then after the video is over, find your comment and reply to it if your feelings have changed. It'll be interesting to see how your emotions evolve as we dive into this insane rabbit hole. Please pause the video and comment down below in 3, 2, 1. Paul Fitzgerald, what a devil. I'm assuming that's how most of you feel. After all, how could someone do something so cruel to another person for no apparent reason? Richard Huckle surely didn't deserve this fate. Nothing could warrant a death so cold and callous, right? I mean, Paul Fitzgerald is the monster you don't want hiding under your bed, greeting you at the end of your nightmare, but the truth is, what you've heard so far is only the end of the story. The tip of an iceberg attached to a full glacier of some of the coldest desires imaginable. This story is truly unthinkable already, but the unbelievable part starts here. So the question is, why kill a Sunday school teaching, picture-taking, traveling missionary in such a brutal and heartless way? Well, all questions will be answered. I'm Mr. Black. And this is the disturbing truth about why Richard Huckle was brutally murdered. The disturbing truth will continue in a moment. Richard Huckle was born into a middle-class family in Ashford, Kent, England, on April Fool's Day in 1986. He studied at Harvey Grammar School in Folkestone. Apart from being considered a bit of a loner, most of Huckle's friends stated that he was a normal guy. Outside of petty crimes like selling counterfeit Pokemon cards, Richard was a mostly liked individual by his peers and had every opportunity available to become successful. It's worth noting that this did not exclude him from being the target of bullies who thought he was strange or referred to his appearance as rat-like. When Richard was only 16, he spent a month visiting a school in Namibia in southern Africa. Huckle did very well with his lower education GCSEs, but in Harvey Grammar School, it's reported that he had a hard time with his AS levels. When he turned 17, he was gifted a digital camera as a birthday present, which fueled his ambitions to become a photographer. Unfortunately, this pleasantly innocent ambition would later darken its shade in the hands of Richard Huckle. Richard turned to Christianity in 2004. He was a member of Ashford Baptist Church. Other members of the same congregation depicted Richard Huckle as a quiet man but the pastor of another church he attended in London would later state that Huckle only seemed to attend the church whenever he got to be around children. And he was absolutely right. Richard learned the ropes of photography while taking photos for the church at baptisms and other religious events. Through this, Huckle realized that photography was his true passion and in turn dropped his AS level courses before attending Kent College where he studied ICT and completed his GCSEs in photography. After completing his education, Huckle spent a gap year in Malaysia from 2005 to 2006. It was set up by an organization called World Challenge, 
It placed Richard in an animal conservation program located in the jungle with a number of other Britons. But working with animals wasn't really what Richard Huckle wanted to do. So he went to the World Challenge head office in Malaysia and explained that he'd rather offer his services to schools and orphanages. It's reported that one orphanage was selected, but it was unable to accommodate him for some reason. As you'll soon find out, this was a blessing in disguise for the children of that facility. Instead, Richard and fellow traveler Sammy G were sent to work in school and assist in teaching English to young children. Sammy G, who shared an apartment with Huckle at the time, recalls that he was a nervous character and didn't interact with anyone very much. Not even the children in the school. But that didn't stop Richard from causing problems. It wasn't long before it was discovered that he'd been writing a blog in which he was unpleasantly referring to other fellow gap year travelers and the World Challenge organization itself. Needless to say, it didn't sit well with his peers. But I'm not sure Richard cared about them. They were a little too old for him to consider at all. In October 2005, Richard began a new World Challenge placement at Praise Church. They let Richard Huckle teach Sunday school to the children of the congregation. This is what would later be referred to as his hunting ground for his evil crimes. Huckle kept a diary. It always baffles me when evil monsters document their acts in this way. Even with psychos like Paul Fitzgerald, writing down your crimes just seems so foolish for someone who doesn't want to get caught. Nevertheless, it's exactly what Richard Huckle did. As soon as he started working at Praise Church, he started jotting down very odd comments about the children he worked with there. One entry from Huckle's diary reads, I had some of the children sit down with me for a cuddle. We got out the mattress and had a relaxed session. The church's pastor would later claim that Huckle had no unsupervised access to the children and that he wasn't a Sunday school teacher at all. But according to the World Challenge Organization, Huckle was dropped by the company after a parent accused him of hitting children. Unfortunately, after one week, Richard was hired by the church itself, putting him back in contact with children, and there was nothing World Challenge could do about it. This is apparently all discussed in Richard's diary. While independently employed by Praise Church, Richard studied the language of Tamil which allowed him to communicate with fellow church members. It also made them trust him and accept him. So much so that local families would invite him into their homes without a second thought. It was unknowingly an invitation to the boogeyman. At some point in 2006, Richard Huckle took a trip to Cambodia. It's believed that the worst of his crimes may have begun during this time. Others claim his evil acts began at the praised church itself. No one seems to know for sure, but one thing is certain. Wherever Richard Huckle went, abuse was sure to follow. Richard grew fond of a little girl in the church. She was only three years old. Over the span of several years, Richard Huckle raped and abused her repeatedly. It's not an accusation, it's a fact. He used his camera to film what he did to that poor, innocent child. And as if that wasn't sick enough, he forced her to watch the videos he made of her personal abuse while he abused her further. It looks like we found the UK's rat man. The girl told her dad that Huckle had been abusing her, but her pleas were sadly brushed off and she was told to keep quiet. What a horrible mistake. Richard established himself outside of Praise Church too. 
He even found a small village that welcomed him in and allowed him to help teach English. The village in question primarily consists of poor, uneducated families from India. Richard touted himself as a freelance photographer and claimed he was simply there for that purpose. So the community let him in and even gave him a place to stay while he was there. The villagers claimed they saw no suspicious behavior from Huckle and they said he came across as a perfectly normal person. But looks can be deceiving because for almost a decade, Richard Huckle raped and abused almost 30 children from that exact village. It began with pictures and later escalated to touching the children inappropriately. All the victims were between four and seven years old, and it didn't go unnoticed. Red flags were up in the village. Reports state that multiple parents were concerned, but again the worries were hushed and ignored. In 2006, Richard went to Cambodia for two weeks. He stayed with a family that often let travelers stay with them in exchange for a small amount of money. Huckle would go on to molest their two-year-old daughter. These horrific acts were also captured on video. Some reports state that Huckle actually raped two sisters aged four and six on the same trip. It's unknown if these reports are referring to the same family, but Richard did stay with the family again in 2007. It's believed that the abuse may have continued then, and it's highly possible that both girls were from the same family. The disturbing truth will continue in a moment. Reports claim that Richard stayed in Malaysia after finishing his gap year. During this time, he'd take frequent trips back and forth between there and the UK until he permanently moved to Malaysia in 2010. Huckle took a CELTA course with the British Council that enabled him to teach the English language to adults. After that, he earned a student visa to study IT and started working as a freelance photographer locally around the capital city of Kuala Lumpur. After the completion of his CELTA course, Huckle began posting on various sites advertising himself as an English teacher. This made his access to the children even easier to obtain. Richard worked in orphanages, schools, and even served as a private tutor for families. They not only gave this rat access to their kids, they actually paid him to be around them. Huckle would often hang around the coastal area of Port Dixon, it wasn't far from Kuala Lumpur, and the location was known to attract a lot of families. He would take his camera to the beach and photograph children. Then he'd offer families prints of the photos he took of their kids. This was a way to earn their trust and initiate conversation. The conversation would then lead to Richard offering to teach their children English for free. Unsuspecting parents must have thought they hit the lottery. Little did they know... Richard Huckle felt the same. He wrote in his diary, I'm back again at Port Dixon and staying around the house of my 12th family. I spent time with the baby, trying to get her to sleep in a hammock. One can only imagine what that little girl experienced at the ratty hands of this monster. Over nine years, Huckle visited India four different times. He attended several orphanages, but they state that he was never allowed to be alone with the children. Luckily, a few of them didn't like his character and weren't as trusting of him as others. Huckle visited India's New Hope for Children orphanage in 2013. He emailed the pastor, George Fernandez, asking for permission to visit, stating, I'm interested in visiting your orphanages in Bangalore and Amber. It would be a great experience for me to visit your orphanage, meet, and help the children. Huckle said he could speak basic Tamil, 
and explained that his photography and editing skills would be of great benefit to the pastor's ministries. The unknowing pastor let him stay in his own house. He stayed there for two days. Pastor Fernandez said that Richard would never look straight into their eyes during his short stay. He added that Huckle emailed him again later saying he was keen to return to the orphanage, but luckily he never did. Nor did he make contact with the pastor again. He must have got the feeling that Fernandez was no pushover. After Richard was eventually caught, the New Hope for Children Orphanage released a statement on their Facebook page assuring everyone that Richard was never alone with the children of New Hope and that luckily none of the kids in the orphanage were ever harmed in any way by Huckle. To this day there have been no investigations into his time in India. But I don't for a second believe that this rat was capable of being close to children without getting his claws dirty. There's simply no easy way to state the fact that Richard Huckle sexually abused children. Ages ranged from 13 all the way down to 6 months old. But not only did he violate their innocence and cruelly steal a part of them, but he found a way to make money off of what he stole from those helpless children. He was profiting off of what he did to those kids, and he was doing so in a way that's hard to fathom. With that camera he was so fond of, he photographed and videoed most of his victims. He used this horrific homemade media as a means for financial gain by uploading the files to the dark web. As a matter of fact, he'd been uploading hundreds upon thousands of images of his sick child abuse acts since around 2005. This story is no rabbit hole. This is a rat hole. Rat like Richard Huckle had a few places online where he liked to distribute his evil media, but his number one spot was a horrible site called The Love Zone. Thankfully, this fucked up place is reportedly no longer available on the dark web. But at the time, it was one of the biggest and most secure hotspots for pedophiles to get their sick stimulation material. And by hotspot, I mean the site was a nest that had an estimated 45,000 active members. It's an eye-opening number. Can you imagine a hundred pedophiles in a room? Multiply that by 10. Now multiply that by 45. It's mind-bogglingly depraved and hard to even consider in the mind of a normal person. But the love zone had a quantity of just that. 45,000 sick fucks were trading images of themselves abusing children on the love zone. Apparently the site even had its own categories where users could pick what kind of abuse they were into. Oh I know, it's an infuriating jaw-clenching idea. A community of adults of such a vast number that enjoy exchanging material of children being literally damaged for life as a means to please themselves sexually. You may ask yourself how law enforcement weren't able to shut it down fast enough, and how did the site maintain its security and membership numbers? Well, that was all down to the rules of the love zone. Basically, each member had to upload material every month. If they didn't, they were likely to be booted from the site. If an account even looked slightly suspicious, it would immediately be terminated. And the site also had a ranking system. If members uploaded more content, their ranks increased. The top rank on the site was reportedly called the producer's area. Only the top pedo content creators reached this high rank. But luckily for the children of this world, in 2014, Australian Task Force Argos had secretly taken over the site and had been closing in on around 30 of its members for months. It seemed that the Tor Deep Web Browser wasn't enough to keep the good guys from getting into the rat cave. It was clear that the cheese pizza loaded trap was about to snap down on the neck of ratty Richard Huckle. 
But how did the police do it? Well, they unfortunately had to use bait in the form of an actual child pornography video to lure the rats in. The task force used a hyperlink that directed abusers to an external site that hosted the bait video. If they opened the video, the abuse images began to play, but the cops were simultaneously recording the user's IP address. They exploited a session identifier that linked the IP address to an account on the love zone. Boom. All the king's mice and all the king's rats were about to be dragged from their nest by the claws of the cat. But hold on. Gaining access to the love zone was no easy matter and it didn't start with the Australian police. As a matter of fact, it began with Project Spade in Canada. In October of 2010, the Toronto Police Service became in contact with an individual on the internet who was distributing graphic child sexual abuse media. The cops were able to trace the internet connection to a male living in the city of Toronto. He was running and operating a site called Azov Films. It was a place where customers internationally could order films and have them sent to their homes all over the world. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to talk about Project Spade this morning. In October 2010, undercover online officers with the Child Exploitation Section of the Toronto Police Service made contact with a male on the internet who was sharing very graphic images of young children being sexually abused. Through investigations, the officers were able to trace the internet connection to a male living in Toronto. The investigation revealed that this individual was running an exploitation movie production and distribution company from an address within the city of Toronto. This company operated a website known as www.azoffilms.com where customers from around the world could place orders to have movies sent to them through the mail or through the internet. Investigators believe many of these movies were consistent with the Canadian Criminal Code definition of child pornography. At this time, the Toronto Police Service sought the assistance of the United States Postal Inspection Service as it appeared many of the movies were being exported into the United States. The Toronto Police Service and the United States Postal Inspection Service then began a joint investigation. On May 1, 2011, after a seven-month-long investigation, officers executed numerous search warrants at various locations across the City of Toronto. One of these search warrants was executed at the site of the purported business located in the West End of Toronto. Officers spent four days inside this business, cataloging the thousands of movies, computers and other media located during their search. At this time, over 45 terabytes of information was seized from the business. And to give you some perspective, this is equivalent to a stack of paper as tall as 1,500 CN Towers. On the same date, a search warrant was also executed at the residence of the owner-operator of the business, Mr. Brian Way. It is alleged that officers located hundreds of thousands of images and videos detailing horrific sexual acts against very young children, some of the worst that they have ever viewed. Brian Way, 42 years of age, has been charged with a total of 24 offenses, including numerous child pornography, proceeds of crime offenses, and instructing a criminal organization. We believe this is the first time in Canada that anyone has been charged with being a part of a criminal organization in regards to child pornography. It is alleged that Mr. Way's company had revenues in excess of $4 million during the years he was operating. It is also alleged that Mr. Way paid people to have children filmed in Eastern European countries in order to produce some of the movies that he would sell online. These producers of the child exploitation movies, which were sold exclusively through Azov Films, have all been convicted in their respective countries. After seven months of investigating, on May 1st of 2011, several search warrants were exercised across the city of Toronto. One of those search warrants was performed on a business in Toronto's West End. After four days of searching, seizing, and cataloging thousands of movies, computers, and various other forms of media, Toronto police had obtained over 45 terabytes of information. Police also conducted another search at the home of the business owner, Brian Way. The search of his property alone uncovered thousands of images that clearly showed the horrible abuse and sexual exploitation of innocent children. 
The media the Toronto police found in Brian Way's home was some of the worst they'd ever come across. Project Spade was a massive success, and 42-year-old Canadian Brian Way was arrested and charged with 15 offenses by way of 165 videos that were produced and distributed by his company, Azov Films. 386 is the number of children used in the films. The kids were from Ukraine, Spain, Romania, and even Australia. It's reported that all of them were 12 or younger, with the youngest being just five years old. Even though Brian Way pleaded guilty, he was only sentenced to 10 years in prison. And as if that wasn't light enough, because Brian alleged he was abused while in jail and custody, his prison term was sadly reduced. The disturbing truth will continue in a moment. Thanks to Project Spade, over the course of around three years, 348 filthy rats were convicted of their crimes and brought to some sort of justice. This included a man from Queensland, Australia. After police seized and investigated his computer, they found that he too was a member of the Love Zone on the dark web. This was a huge step forward as police now had control of an account on this horrible child abuse site. Now the real heavy lifting was underway as law enforcement began to track the owner of the love zone. They realized that the owner of the site was likely to be Australian due to images he posted on the site that depicted the land down under. Now they had a possible location. But still, Finding the Love Zone's owner was like finding a speck of dust on the beach. But Paul Griffiths, a Task Force Argos officer, and his team decided to set their focus on an unusual word that the Love Zone's owner often began his messages with. It was a word that no one on the Task Force used, nor were they familiar with. Paul knew that, while chances were slim, this word just might lead them to the Rat King after all. So Task Force Argo started Google searching the word Hayas with an apostrophe S. They came up with thousands of results all over the internet, but pretty much all of them were linked back to females, and Argos knew they were looking for a man. Then suddenly they struck gold. On a forum site for discussing four-wheel drive vehicles, they found a match. The poster was in Adelaide, Australia, his post submission started with the word Hayas, and his username closely matched the owner of the Love Zone's username. Check. The Rat King's reign was coming to an end. To further sink in the death blow, the task force found the word Hayas and the same username on a basketball forum. Argos now knew for sure they had their rat. On the four-wheel drive forum, they noticed that the Rat King was looking for a Delta 4x4 body lift kit. Someone on Facebook in the Adelaide area was looking for the same exact parts at the same exact time for a Volkswagen. But the account was a sock puppet account. It wasn't linked to anyone. It was a mere throwaway profile. But Task Force Argos didn't let this stop them. Posing as a normal user, Authorities began asking the account questions about the vehicle that the person wanted to raise, and lo and behold, the user responded with a picture of a white Volkswagen Amarok. The fool never even blurred his reg. It was checkmate for the rat king of the love zone. He had taken the cheese, and after the police ran the plates, the trap snapped once again. 32-year-old Shannon McCool was arrested in connection with controlling and operating the love zone on the dark net. It was the easiest part of the whole operation.
police literally casually knocked on Shannon's door. And he answered. When he was arrested, the silly rat's laptop was already open, logged into, and waiting for the cops to seize everything. They now had access to everything they needed. It was a massive victory. It may as well have been Christmas for Task Force Argos, as literally years of covert investigations had finally paid off. But the horrific details that followed would no doubt tint the success of the operation in a dark shade of deep depravity. You see, Shannon McCool was employed by the government. He had been in his career for 10 years. His job was to look after children from all over the world. Alarms were even set off a couple times during Shannon's employment to the state. He was even accused of acting physically inappropriate with the children by his co-workers. Not to mention this dead rat walking had been convicted of gross indecency, aggravated indecent assault twice, and sadly, aggravated production of child pornography involving a two-year-old. Now you tell me how this asshole was ever allowed near children. Why didn't anyone step in and stop this? This negligent mistake aided the theft of the innocence of hundreds of children around the world. Children that may never recover. Because there's nothing you can do to restore stolen innocence. Shame on the people who let this malevolent rodent near kids after knowing and witnessing what he's capable of. A former boss of Shannon McCool has broken down giving evidence to the Royal Commission saying she felt there was something not right about the convicted paedophile. She lamented how her superior would brush off any complaints about him because they were friends. The assistant director of an out of school hours care service says Shannon McCall just appeared at the centre in 2010 after being hired by the director who he was friends with. She said she felt there was something not right about his personality and behaviour but her boss brushed off concerns. There were a number of things I would tell her and she would say that's just Shannon. The assistant director broke down giving evidence revealing she's since questioned her career but she said it was difficult to approach her superior because she was friends with McCall. I didn't want to upset her, but now it was wrong of me. I know I should have done something. McCall's former boss again denied today that their friendship clouded her judgment, but she admitted she missed things over his four-year employment. Also missing McCall's out-of-school hours care personnel file. It's been requested by the commissioner, but both witnesses believe it was misplaced after his arrest. Lauren Barker, Nine News. Shannon McCall was charged with 18 offences dealing with child abuse he inflicted on the kids in his care while working for the state between 2011 and 2013. As if there wasn't enough evidence to convict Shannon already, he was identified in the abuse videos he made via a small freckle on his ratty finger. In 2015, he was convicted and sentenced to 35 years in prison. Good evening. Victims have cheered in court as family's SA carer Shannon McCool was jailed for three decades for inflicting vile sexual abuse on already troubled children. McCool, who was also the kingpin of a global child porn network, was described by the judge as a worldwide evil like he'd never seen before. Shannon McCall needs protection from other inmates in jail, but the children he abused were denied that right under his care. Instead, he stole their innocence in the most sickening of ways, and he'll now pay with the next 35 years of his life. I've got no remorse for him at all. I, I hope that he gets what he deserves. McCall cried as Judge Paul Rice described in harrowing detail the repulsive crimes inflicted on seven children. The former family's SA carer was trusted to look after them in a government-run residential facility. But when one of the state's heaviest sentences was imposed on him, the courtroom erupted into applause. It's over in one part of it's over and now it's I can deal with our family trauma. McCall's victims were as young as 18 months. Some were disabled, all were vulnerable. I don't know how these guys don't get life for these crimes. I will never understand that. If you sexually abuse kids, you shouldn't get to live, one way or another. But yet again, 
The grip of justice slipped slightly when Shannon McCool's sentence was reduced from 35 years to 28. But reportedly he could be out in just 26 years because he helped lead authorities to the arrest and conviction of other fellow pedophiles. Why the hell do we have to honor our promises to filthy rats? Brisbane Police Headquarters controlled the Love Zone for around six months, during which time they gathered as much intel about the site's users as they could. They made a list of the Love Zone's most notorious members. Members who uploaded the most content or were the most active on the site. And guess whose name wound up at the peak of that list? None other than Britain's own Richard Huckle. Richard was reportedly in the site's producer tier. He uploaded new material weekly. It was exclusive new content of the children he abused. He even condemned other members on the love zone that he felt were just living off the content that he and others produced. He found those people to be fakes while he was out there actually living the pedophile life. Richard was so into the scene that he wanted to leave a legacy behind and hoped he'd be remembered for the material he created. He was in so deep that he began titling his work and referring to his abuse locations as his studio. But Huckle was deranged and deluded even in the pedo community. His material wasn't actually that popular and neither was he. Even on a filthy site like The Love Zone, Richard's arrogance didn't play well. He just wasn't a very likable person. Even in a community made up of the absolute scum of the earth. But Richard wasn't stupid. He was smart enough to blur faces, obscure backgrounds, and even erase metadata out of his productions. This was certainly an obstacle, but... Authorities started to zero in on a location after a fellow pedo wrote to Richard on the site and said, It's a pity you're so far away. Richard responded saying, I'm probably closer than you think. This, among other details, led law enforcement to Southeast Asia. Specifically, Malaysia. The disturbing truth will continue in a moment. The biggest, most devastating breakthrough in this case came from Richard's camera. But it wasn't the media. It was the actual camera. Richard hadn't scrubbed the data that revealed the make and model of his Olympus camera. And with that information, cops scoured sites like Flickr to find pictures that linked to Southeast Asia and the same type of camera. And guess what? They found them. And the subjects of the pictures were actually legal images of children from the region in question. With this information, cops now had Richard Huckle's email address, which I imagine was something like Richard the Rat at Ratface.com. Probably not. But that email address linked him to several other accounts across the internet. It seemed like the walls of the rat maze were quickly closing in on Richard Huckle. Not only did the email address from Flickr lead to an account on the Love Zone, but it also led authorities straight to Richard's business, Huckle Photography Productions. And guess where it was based out of? Malaysia. And lo and behold, that connected the cops to Huckle's personal Facebook page. It would be on this profile that police would obtain all the answers they were looking for. You see, Richard Huckle had been posting seemingly innocent photos of his abuse victims right on his public Facebook page for anyone and everyone to see. The cat had its rat. But because Richard was British, the information was immediately passed on to UK authorities. But miraculously, Richard would continue to walk free for four months due to Malaysian authorities claiming that there just wasn't enough evidence for them to intervene. So the UK could do nothing but wait. And as they did, it's certain that the lives of more children were destroyed. Soon enough, Richard posted that he would be coming back to the UK to visit. And on December 19th of 2014, 
Richard's flight arrived at Gatwick Airport. His dad was there waiting for him, but authorities arrested him before he could be reunited with his family. It was game over for our greasy little English rat. His hard drives and computers were seized and searched. Cops fought encryption on some of the data and got nowhere in an interrogation with Huckle who refused to comment. Without passwords or previous convictions, Huckle was released on bail under the condition that he resides at his parents' house. It seemed like a small win for Richard until his mother questioned him about the allegations. Surprisingly, Richard admitted his guilt. His mother and father reportedly begged the police to take their son away and refused to let him stay with them. Fair play to them for that. And so he was arrested and charged with over 90 counts of sexual offenses on children, including making a pedophile menu. He was remanded without bail this time. But in 2016 at his hearing, Richard Huckle pleaded not guilty to all of his charges. And it reportedly took more than an hour for them to be read. The prosecution started prepping three different trials because they didn't think one single jury alone should be subjected to the vast array of crimes that Huckle committed that included horrifically graphic evidence. I mean, the case was so bad that each juror was reportedly given a counselor to help them mentally cope with the details of the case. It was clearly going to be a tough trial to hear, let alone present. But luckily, police managed to crack some of Huckle's encryption on his devices. This put them in possession of over 20,000 child abuse images, including around 1,000 that showed Huckle abusing kids. Authorities never fully cracked Richard's devices, but they claimed that what they did uncover is only a fraction of the child abuse material that Huckle was hiding. In April, Richard Huckle pleaded guilty to 71 of the 91 charges held over his rat-like head. The charges involved 23 boys and girls aged between 12 years old and 6 months old. 22 of the victims are said to be from Malaysia. One of them is said to be from Cambodia. What you're about to hear next is a list of the offenses Richard was convicted of. Hold on to your seats, because this is disturbing. Richard Huckle was convicted of three counts of causing a child under 13 to engage in sexual activity, three counts of causing a child under 13 to engage in penetrative activity, six counts of assault by penetration, 12 counts of taking indecent photos of children, 13 counts of rape of a child under 13, 31 counts of sexual assault of a child under the age of 13, creating over 20,000 indecent images, advertising child pornography, and finally, facilitating child sex offenses by writing a pedophile manual. While the case only covered 23 victims, Prosecutors believe that Richard may have indeed had over 200 children that he preyed upon. He often posted on the Love Zone boasting about his sick acts of child abuse. He said poor kids are easier to seduce than Western middle-class children. He also stated that he would be posting a guide on the subject at some point. But the sickest insight into Richard Huckle's rat-like mind from hell is what he said about a three-year-old child he abused. He said, and I quote, I'd hit the jackpot, a three-year-old girl as loyal to me as my dog, and nobody seemed to care. The three-year-old I can have so much sex with that it's just boring. Well, at least now she's ready for business with pedo funding. End quote. Pedo funding was another pedo site on the dark web. It's hard to listen to myself say Richard's words out loud. It makes me angry and I feel like I want to scrub my tongue with soap. How can someone become so evil? How can you carelessly destroy so many innocent lives for your own pleasure? It disgustingly makes no sense to me. I mean, this horrible human being wrote a 60-page child sexual abuse manual titled Pedophiles and Poverty, Child Lover Guide. In it, he describes how to get away with child abuse in Asia. That's about as sick as it gets, right? Think again. 
From November of 2013, Richard Huckle started ranking his abuse crimes on a point-based system. He called this the pedo points chart. In the chart, there were 15 categories. Each one was worth a different number of points. The highest ranking category was rape. It was worth 15 points. When Huckle committed an act from a category on his chart, he'd award himself points according to the rank of the category. Within a year of creating the chart, Huckle claimed to have a score of 1,305. And that was in one single year. Don't forget, Richard was at large for almost a decade before he was brought to justice. And justice served him 22 life sentences. But as you know, that's where the trap would snap, exterminating ratty Richard Huckle. Or I guess you could say that Richard got caught in a cat and mouse game. And in that case, I suppose we could call him Jerry. Jerry with a bad ending. Earlier, I asked you to stop this video and comment down below about your feelings on Paul Fitzgerald and what he did to Richard Huckle. So tell me, have your feelings changed from your previous comment? I'm curious. While you think about it, how about I tell you how I feel? I'll be quick. When it comes to Richard Huckle and Paul Fitzgerald, my thoughts are, any, many, miny, mo. Cyanide would end them both. No sympathy for human monsters. Never. I'm Mr. Black, and this is The Disturbing Truth.
Coming, we are coming for you. 